Uh, we'll start off with the preliminary carpet preparation. So it starts with the engine master levers cut off. Engine start selector is normal. Check that the landing gear lever is down. Windscreen wipers are off. And then we move on to the battery check. The sequence of switching off the batteries and switching them back on is quite important to prevent spurious dispatch messages. We start off first uh, by switching off from right to left with uh, battery two, and then battery emergency two, battery emergency one, and battery one. We check the voltage on the overhead panel to make sure that they're above 25 volts. Well, I normally start with battery two, yeah, 29.1, battery one, 28.9, emergency battery two is 29.5, and emergency battery one's 29.2. So they're all above 25 volts. If they weren't above 25 volts, it will need to do a charge cycle, which lasts 45 minutes. Switching the batteries back on again from left to right, battery one on, battery emergency one on, battery emergency two on, battery two on. We then connect the external power that we have, what we should have external power. If we've only got one, we connect external power two. If we have two external powers, we connect external two first and then external one. Uh, that prevents unnecessary reconfigurations. And then we switch on the IRSs, because a lot of the systems depend on the IRSs. Start off with IR1, and then on to IR2, and then IR3. After that, we check the cockpit lights. The standby compass and eye reference light. Check the enunciator lights as appropriate, bright and dim. And then the FCU lights. And then move down to the cockpit lights, the floodlights, dome lights, the integrated lights, and the DU master bright. And each of the DUs have their own individual uh, dimming and brighting buttons, as well as contrast buttons. And that's the end of the preliminary couple of preparations. Now we're going to start all the EFBs by pushing the start button on the EFB laptop container. So the CM2 starts up his EFB as well. So while the EFB is starting up, we're going to initialize the uh, FMS, which is the init button. I put the cursor on the MFD page. On the active init page, I'm going to insert the SAA flight number. I'm going to highlight the flight number box and insert SAA323 and I'm going to execute it. It jumps automatically to the aircraft status page. I'm going to click on the aircraft status page. On this page, data status, I'm going to check the aircraft type A350900P. I'm going to check the engine type, Trent. XWB84, the fuel penalty. I'm going to check we have the active database. I'm going to ensure there are no pilot stored waypoints. Delete them if they are. And I'm going to check the idle and performance factors on this page. Once complete, I'm going to return to the NIT active page. Now I'm going to insert my FROM2 in the highlighted boxes. I'm going to insert Fox Alpha Oscar Romeo. Insert and two Fox Alpha Charlie Tango. Insert. A company route comes up. It's one of the stored company routes. I'm going to insert it. I'm now going to go to my EFB flight up status page. On the OIS screen, we now state status page. We check the um, aircraft type, registration, weight variance. We check the EFB version, is the current EFB version. In the bottom left hand corner, we now press the Synchro Avionics button. This imports the flight number and the origin and destination into the OIS. We can now check our OIS, the flight number is correct, and the from two is correct as per your MFD. So at this point, we'll go out of the EFB and initialize the ACOS. 
by pushing the OS avionics button. We now go to the company com communication. We can insert that. We go to pre-flight, init data, and as you can see, it's re-imported from two and the flight number. We now have to just insert the captain and co-pilot's name. And then send. Enter. And we also put Dion's name. We can then send that to AOC. And then once the captain has uh, finished the initialization on the MFD and synchroed the avionics, we cross check the EFB version and then also make sure that the aircraft type the registration, flight number, and from two have been imported correct. That's the IOS initialization completed. Now I'm going to do the ECAM logbook check. I'm going to push the recall button for three seconds to display any recall messages. I'm then going to push the deferred dispatch button to um, recall any uh, dispatch messages. I'm then going to get the aircraft logbook or TL3, consult any CDL or MEL items. I'm then going to accept the aircraft. The CM2 then also checks the ECAM, the dispatch messages, as well as the TL3 and ME, any ME and CDLs with a cat. What we're going to do now is the fire test and APU start. So we'll start off with the radios and we turn the RMPs on. Make sure that the standby rad nav buttons are off. That an appropriate frequency is tuned. The one is always there, so you can only stop. You, it's possible to start with the number behind it. So we'll say two. You can tune it. Then make sure that the interphone is unlatched and we set it so that we can speak to the ground engineer if we have to. From there, we do the fire test. We start on the top, we check that the fire switches all in and capped and that there are no lights. Then do the fire test by pressing the fire test button and we'll get the continuous repetitive chime. Check that all the fire lights are on, all the squib lights are on, all the discharge lights are on, that the main landing gear fire light is on, the master warning on the ECAM, we have engine one fire, engine two fire, APU fire, main landing gear bay fire, and then on the engine master levers, you also have the two fire warnings. We start the APU. So put the APU master switch to on. You see the APU has come up on the system display, and then we start. Once the APU is available, we then can turn on the APU bleed, then set up the air panel. I check that the cross bleed is auto. The airflow is normal. Uh, with a normal one, it'll go to max until we put passenger numbers in. Then set up the cockpit temperature. In the cabin we put on versus cell. After that, we can go to the external power. As you can see, the APU is running. It has taken over the left-hand side of the electric. We can go to the external power and deselect external one because the APU is now running that side. So now we do the ORS preparation and LPC performance figures. We go to the surveillance um, ADC comm panel and we go up to digital ATIS and we can type in our departure aerodrome and ask for an update on the ATIS. Once we have the ATIS, we're gonna to go to the um, EFB and we're gonna do our performance calculations. Johannesburg, I insert a runway, which will be 03 left. Gonna insert the wind. The wind is 3108 knots. 
Can we set the outside air temperature of 24 degrees? The QNH 1015. Runway condition is dry. It's taking anti ice off. And I'm going to select the takeoff weight from the theta. Today our takeoff weight will be uh, 210 tons. Togo thrust, Togo flex. We're going to select Togo flex max. Okay. Um, cancel. We're going to go to climb thrust. We're going to select auto D rate climb, which is selected. Configuration. We're going to select optimum configuration. Air conditioning, we can select air conditioning off. We can consult any out or see other items on null for this flight. And then we can need compute. So CM2 will then load up the same in the uh, takeoff performance page as the CM1. And then they will cross check the performance figures. Once we have both computed our performance figures independently, we're going to cross check them. We do this by pressing the uh, cursor to go to the next page and then we cross check them by the pilot flying, reading the takeoff runway, the takeoff shift, the V speeds, the flex toga value, the flaps, the packs on or off and the anti ice off, the engine out acceleration and then we consider OEBs. Ian, are you ready? Yes. We've got uh, Zulu Sierra, Sierra Delta Charlie, is A350-900. Runway 03 left in Joburg, 0 shift. 151, 153, 157, and a flex thrust of 47. Flaps is 1 plus F. With the line is, I'm going to review the air conditioning pack off, anti ice off, engine out acceleration 7058. We're now going to review the OEBs. We go to the top left hand menu. On the drop down menu, we push Ops Library. From there we go into the FCOMs, and in the FCOMs we go down to OEB. Right, so select OEB, performance, on the ops library. If you have something else displayed here, you can go to the bookmark looking thing to get to the shortcut for OEB. For instance, if it looks like that, select that one, we'll go to OEB. and then we're going to transfer it to the center screen so that we both can see the OEBs. Right there, we're now going to review the OEBs together. We have two OEBs in this aircraft. One is a RA height dis disturbance when overflying another aircraft. After the OEB review, the roles changes from CM1 and CM2 to pilot flying and pilot monitoring. I will now do the pilot monitoring checks, which are the next ones in sequence. So we start off by checking on the doors page. On the doors page, we start off by checking the rain repellent, which this specific uh, aircraft does not have, as well as the oxygen for the captain and first officer. After that, we then check the hydraulics. The hydraulic fluids of the green and yellow are within acceptable range. And then we check the engine oils. Selecting the engine page. As you can see, the FedEx are not powered. So we're going to switch on the FADEC ground power switches. We check the engine oil quantity for a minimum of 13 quarts. We're going to have to switch the FADEC ground power switches off again. Then we come down to the flap lever. And on the bottom of the PFD, you can see the flap position. And we check that the flap lever corresponds with the flap indication. And again, we don't move the flaps without checking uh, with engineering first. The spoilers, we also check that they're retracted and you can see at the bottom of the PFD, the spoilers that will be indicated on the top. Again, if they don't correspond, don't move them until you get clearance from engineering. Check that the green and yellow accumulator pressure on the green. If they're not, uh, there's also a procedure to repressurize them, reinflate them, and depending on which ground power or electrical power configuration you have, you could do it directly or you might have to switch off some hydraulic pumps. Then we check that the park brake is on. And then at the bottom of the PFD, you can also see the park brake indication is on. 
after the park brake check, we then check the safety equipment and then go and do the walk out. As pilot flying, I'm going to do the overhead panel scan. I'm going to start with the evacuation command on captain. The crew oxygen supply, I'm going to put on. I'm then going to arm the ground recorder. I'm going to go up to the cockpit equipment power supply buttons are all in. The reset buttons are all in. We then come down to the exterior lighting and make sure the strobe's in auto. Beacon is off. Nav logo will be on number one system. We only use number two system if one is inoperative. Logo will be on auto. Exterior lights will be off. Come across to the seatbelt signs. Once refueling is finished, we turn them on. PDs will be on auto. And we uh, emergency exit light, we put in the arm position. We come across to your probe window heat, make sure it's in auto. Lights are out. On the air panel, we're going to check AP bleeds on, cross bleed is auto, air flow is in norm, cockpit temperature as desired, and cabin is on person select. We're going to check all white lights are out, the fuel pumps on. From there, we're up to the maintenance panel. All white lights should be off, but for ground uh, preparation, we could have the CB remote light on or the ground comm light on. From there, we're going to come down to the air conditioning panel. We're going to check that the temperature selector is selected as desired uh, for the forward and the aft bulk cargoes. From there, we're going to go to the cockpit voice recorder. We're going to test it, three, not longer than three seconds. And there's no ECAM warning, which means the test is successful. We're going to check the cockpit equipment power supply switches and the reset switches are all in. The OBE panel scan completed. The center instrument panel, we're going to check air data is in auto, FMS is on norm. Passes, we're going to check that the current nature set and the altimeter indication is correct. We're going to come across and check that the anti skid nose wheel steering is on. Okay, we're now going to check the pedestal. Starting at RMP1, we're going to check the frequencies as required. Make sure the NAD ramp is off. Parking brake selector is on, check accumulated pressure. Emergency gear, gravity gear extension, we're going to check is off. Soft lever are both idle with engine masters off and ignition norm. Cockpit door selector is in norm. RMP3 select and tune frequencies as selected. RMP3 select frequencies as selected. From there I'm going to go on to my ADC COM page. I'm going to push ADC COM. We're going to go to our message record at the top tab. And we're going to erase all messages. Select all messages. And then if there were messages, we would erase them all. We go back to the top tab that says connect and we check that the ADS is armed in green. Then we go to the surveillance page and we put the transponder to standby. Confirm it? Yes. Once I've turned the surveillance transponder to standby, I now prepare my OIS clipboard. I go on to the um, drop down menu, I select terminal charts. Terminal charts. I'm then going to go to your FAR clip. I'm going to select FAR clip management. I'm then going to select the taxi chart I need by adding it to my clipboard. I'm then going to go to the departure SRD and I'm going to go to the second page and add the Ragul departure. Once I'm finished adding all the pages, I go back to the clipboard management and it will display all my departure plates I have on my clipboard. Okay. As pilot monitoring for my clipboard management, I could use the same as the pilot flying, as you just saw now, or since I'm a bit lazy, I'm just going to import them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the same um, terminal chart page as what you saw on the earlier one. This time I'm going to go right down to the bottom and I'm going to say import chart setup from offside. Select it. It gives me a caution that the import chart from offside this will replace all airports and clips. That's okay. And there we go. Got it. So then I go down again and accept. And then I can check as well. So the Johannesburg one as you can see uh, from my clip management, all the charts that were selected on the other side are now in 
this side as well. So the nut button. I'm going to run through the basic setup of the MFD. You start on the nut active active init page. The flight number was already inserted. The FROM2 was already populated from our previous um, OAS initialization. We can insert an alternate. If not inserted, let's change that to uh, Bloemfontein. It will then offer you a company route. You can see there's more than one route there. You can either select none or select company route one. I'll insert company route one. We jump down to the cruise flight level. We can insert a cruise flight there with FL360. Mode, we either have Econ or Long Range Cruise. We select Econ and we'll insert a cost index of 30. On the wind, it highlights the trip wind. The options here is to either insert a trip wind or we can go across to the wind page where we can insert history winds, climb winds, and cruise winds at every waypoint. If I return, today we're going to insert a, just a trip wind of say 35 knots, which gives us a tailwind. We then have to go to the cruise temperature and we have to insert a cruise temperature, otherwise there might be anomalies in the climb. Under tropper pause, we don't insert anything under tropper pause, we leave it at a default setting of 36,000. Right, once that's all populated, we drop down to the IRS menu. If you click on the IRS menu, we have the option of aligning on the reference, which is already done, or we can align on a different position. If you just click on it, we can then enable to insert a Latin line. If we click on return, we can go down to the next page, which is the departure page. Here we can um, select the departure runway, 03 left and then we can select a drop-down menu of the Regul departure. Once it's yellow, it means it's a temporary flight plan, and you can see it's all in yellow. Temporary flight plan, and then we can insert the temporary flight plan. All right. Once that's done, we go back to the knit page. The next um, box to fill in is the nav aids. If we click on the nav aids, we can now select the different VORs for display on our NDs. So at the moment we have Julius Victor displayed on ND1 and Julius Victor displayed on ND2. We can change that to read Golf Alpha Victor if you wish. And you can select a course if, if needed. We can also select ADFs and LOC ALICE buttons or ALICE frequencies. The next tab on NavAids is selected for NAV. Yeah, we can go through deselect nav aids for whatever reason. So we can deselect a nav aid of Golf Alpha Victor. So that's where we clear the list of nav aids that, be that have been deselected. If we return, it'll go back to your fuel load. If we click on fuel load, we then can enter the zero fuel weight of 165 tons. And zero fuel at CFG, we can take a if you haven't got the final or freedom load sheet, we can insert 30. And then block fuel, as you can see, we've got 13.2 tons of block fuel. Taxi fuel we can amend, depending on how long our taxi is. Let's make that 400. Number of passengers, at the moment, if we have the premium load sheet, we can, um, from the premium load sheet, put the number of passengers, 200. And then we can just change the route reserve if you want. Let's make that um, 600 kilograms of fuel reserve. The cost index is there again. And then, of course, we have our final, often our final fuel and our alternate fuel. We don't insert anything under the gross weight, jettison gross weight. As you can see at the moment, we have insufficient fuel for our flight to Cape Town. And then we can return. Uh, and then we can look at the takeoff performance. At this stage, we can insert our 
takeoff performance or runway zero three left from our OIS calculated earlier. So our V1 speed was 151, our VR is 153 and 157. Once we've inserted the V speeds, we can then insert a flex thrust or a toga thrust. For the purposes of demonstration, I'm going to put a D rate thrust in. I'm going to D rate to D12, and I can confirm that. For some reason, it's defaulting to toga today. Flaps, we can select our flaps. One, two, three, as per what's on our OIS. And the trim, we can insert from uh, the load sheet. Packs, we can select packs on or packs off on APU and anti ice on or off. We then can adjust the thrust reduction, acceleration altitude, or we can push on noise and then put a noise abatement procedure in if necessary. Transition level and engine out acceleration can be altered. All right, from there we can go to our climb page. On the climb page, we can pre select. A speed, so today I'm going to pre-select 210 knots for the climb. And again, we can change the noise or cancel noise. Here we can insert a speed constraint if, if required. 250, let's make it 250 at flight level 150. Temporary flight plan is created in yellow, and then we can insert our temporary change. All right, that goes back to the init page. We have now completed all the items. We can now go to the flight plan page. In the flight plan page, we can fill in what has ever been left out. So one thing we haven't inserted now is the de arrival, departure into Cape Town. So we can in in insert a departure, a arrival into Cape Town and an approach. ILS Zulu. And I put a star in there, it will be the Erdos 1 Bravo arrival. It's created a temporary flight plan again. I then can insert the temporary flight plan. Once the flight plan is loaded, we can check on the ND page in plan mode with the zoom as appropriate with constraints. You can then scroll through and check all the constraints, bearings and distances between waypoints using the scroll button. We can see we haven't loaded the alternate flight plan, so we can go to the alternate flight plan and we can load a departure for Cape Town, departure runway 19. We can load a departure, we'll load a uh, TTM 1 Alpha departure and I'll insert that. Create a temporary flight plan again, I can then check it on my ND page, if it's right or if it's wrong. Okay, I'm going to insert that temporary flight plan. I then can scroll down and I can load an arrival for Bloemfontein. Runway 20 with uh, on air for 20. And I can insert a via unload. Create a temporary flight plan. I can insert the temporary flight plan. I can then clear the discontinuity, I can remove Bloemfontein, I can right click on it, I can delete Bloemfontein, and I can delete the discontinuity. And I can insert that temporary flight plan. Once it's all loaded, and I can check the flight plan, now then I can go to the top position monitor page, and I can uh, insert a time or check the GNS position or the RAIM accuracy if you're doing an RNAV departure. Once that's completed, we can then look at the secondary flight plan. We have three secondary flight plans. For the first secondary flight plan, we can import the secondary, the active flight plan onto the secondary flight plan. And then if you want to, you can, we can amend that flight plan with a return to Johannesburg. Let's say from Atman, we can then go down and we can then insert a new destination. Appen, we can insert Fox Alpha Oscar Romeo. And uh, we can put an arrival into Joburg. And 
over there. Runway three right, we approach Zulu zero three right, and the star we can put the Nibex to our arrival. Link. That's all on the second. We can check that now. You can see it comes up with the info message of check takeoff data. We can clear that, and that's the basic flight plan loading and setup of the A350. The pilot monitoring will then go through the FMS and check the loading of the pilot flying, make sure that everything was loaded correctly in the FMS. And once we're both seated and that's done, then we start with the FCU. We're going to check our loudspeakers at one o'clock. We're going to set the Q&H, 1015, and I'm going to check, cross-check silently that the altimeters uh, on the PFDs are within 20 foot and within 30 feet of the ISIS, and recorded on the seater. We go to zoom, and we zoom down to the ANF. We take the cursor on the ND, over the menu pop up, we select it, we go to status, select it, and we can check the active database for the AMF. Once completed, we can then close it and then go back to our normal operations with our Zoom. And we can then select constraints, airports, uh, VORs, and traffic. We then go across to your windows, and uh, that'll be 100, 275, mock speed, it's on heading, vertical speed, and we can select flight directors on, and then we can select uh, altitude for our instrument departure, and vertical speed will be zero, and then meters will be off if or on, depending on where you fly. That's the lateral SU panel completed. We then do the lateral console check of the oxygen, which is standard as per our AT30 and AT40 procedures. Once that's complete, we then complete the N2F takeoff briefing. So when the final load sheet arrives, we check the final load sheet against the inserted figures. <clears throat> On the active fuel load page, we check the zero fuel weight, the zero weight CFG, check the block fuel is correct, and we insert the passenger number from the load sheet. Once that's done, we go to the um, takeoff page, I then check the takeoff CFG is within 1% of the ECAM CFG and I insert the ECAM CFG on the takeoff page. So it's 30.1, insert that 30.1. I then hand the load sheet to Dion to check. I will then take the load sheet and check that all the figures have been entered correctly into the FMS and as a final check I will do a cross-check with avionics. Right, so it says takeoff perf, cross-check with avionics, avionics OIS discrepancy, cross-check none. So there are no discrepancies. There are some cross-checks, uh, some things I must cross-check on the MFD, which are the takeoff runway, the takeoff shift, and the engine out acceleration altitude, because those are not cross-checked with avionics. So the next step then is to adjust the seating position and we use the same technique as we do in a 330 but you'll feel that you're sitting a lot higher in the 350 but that is normal. To the seat adjustment the pilot monitoring checks that all the external connections are disconnected, the external air as well as the external power. We have to make sure that the external power available on both uh, disconnecting just like a 330 uh, with it still um, connected to the aircraft electrical if the engineer removes it could cause injury. The before start checklist. Okay, we access the before start checklist with the checklist menu button. We select the uh, before start checklist by scrolling the mouse over highlighting, press the validate key and there we have the before start checklist. Cockpit prep. Completed. Completed. Gear pins and covers. Moved. Fuel quantity. Checked. Take of data. Set. Barrow ref. QNH 1015 set. QNH 1015 set. Down to the line. Request the before star clearance. I'm going to go to the surveillance panel and select default settings. Confirm. I'm then going to select my taxi camera on. I'm then going to check my doors and slides are all closed and slides are all on. 
Put the beaker on. Sus levers are idle. Check the parking brake is on with the criminal pressure in the green. Then check I have Mimo green, parking brake on, and nose wheel steering disconnect. No alarm, please. But as the pilot monitoring, I have the same procedures up to the doors. And then I can leave the before star checkers below the line.